All right, I'd start off the episode by saying, hey, beautiful people, and do my best Michael <laughs> Robinson impersonation. But there was a huge, huge, epic mistake that I made in last week's episode, so I thought this week I would rectify it right off the top. Are you cool with that? Um, let's get it. Okay. What's up? I'm Mike M. He's Michael Robinson. This is NFL Explained. You know, last Stop week I, didn't, I didn't even introduce us. So what? So, I know. People are tuning in to NFL Explained podcast when they were on their phone and they actually clicked the actual link. Come on, man. They knew what they were getting. Yeah, no, no, no. It's a good point. It's a good point. But I'd like to think I'm a professional, although if you've been listening to this episode, that might be <laughs> these episodes. That might be up for debate. Um, but it is a brand new edition of the episode. We are all about quarterbacks. In fact, this episode in particular comes from something that you said on a previous episode. Okay. Sometimes you say stuff and it just, you know, it just <laughs> resonates and we start dreaming about it. And you got to remind me, though, because sometimes I forget. Yeah. Like, a lot. Well, <laughs> you did say something about like the moon and the some solar system reference that has nothing to do oh, with okay. what I was about what, to get into it if no, you needed me. No, to. no, no, no. Oh, we're okay. not going down that okay. path. Uh <laughs> the path that we're gonna go down is this idea that Tom Brady's not the goat. Okay, pause. Uh, sort of uh, well, kind of what depends. you said. I'm twisting it. Yeah, I'm, okay. I'm definitely twisting it. it this entire episode really though is about <laughs> the quarterback and the greatest of all time. And we're gonna lay things out for everyone, talk about some statistics, some of the things that you saw playing yep. against some of these guys, playing with some of these players as well. But in all sincerity, I think a lot of people say Tom Brady's the GOAT. You think about all the Super Bowls, and we'll get to to D B twelve here in just a minute. You had a different designation for him. It's GOAT, but it's the greatest of all time. Not necessarily quarterback. You thought winner. Winner. I mean, you just think about it. What, seven Super Bowls? Yeah. I mean, I, I don't think you think anybody's going to ever get close to that. That, that. That's a lot. And when you talk about the greatest of all time with a certain position, that's a more individual thing. Those Super Bowls is a team thing, and it has a lot of different factors yeah. to it. So I can't wait to get into it. All right, we'll talk about Brady coming up in this episode, but we're knocking on the door. We got we're in the postseason. Yeah. We got the we got the Super Bowl around the corner. That's that's the money making time, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's the biggest stage on the planet. Everyone's watching. Is there a player that comes to mind that really cemented their their legacy as a player because of what they did in that game? I would have to say Eli Manning. Yeah, I mean, think one. about it. Yeah. I mean, if you take the Super Bowl runs, the playoff away. runs away from his career, I'm not so sure we're thinking about Eli Manning as a Hall of Famer. Uh, I would even throw my guy Beast Mode in there. I mean, <laughs> during the playoffs, I mean, he had Beast Quake. I mean, I was in on that play. It was 70 power. We blocked it terribly. And to me, it was one of the greatest runs of, of all time, regardless history, regardless playoffs or whatever. Um, but I would say Beast Mode, and obviously you got guys like Terrell Davis. But yeah, Eli Manning, Beast Mode, those are the guys that stick out for me. The Manning one is a good one. By the way, I know we keep throwing out that term goat. Are you cool <laughs> with that? Should I, like, is there a I'm cool with it. I mean, I, look, so I asked my son, okay, did I, is there any other terms or whatever? He didn't text back yet. He was in school. So I'm still waiting. Uh, That's a that, test. That, that was a test. Do yes, not sir. text me while you're in class. And look, so. I'm always, I'm always <laughs> testing him. Like I'll send him a message on Instagram or something like after he's not supposed to have the phone. And if he responds, yeah. I'm like, dude, what did you respond for? He's like, but dad, you sent the message. I had to respond to dad. No doubt. No uh -huh. doubt. Yeah. Cause if you send a message in the middle of the day when he's not supposed to have the phone and it says, Hey, I love you. And he says, I love you back. You're not going to get mad. <laughs> no, yeah. It's so, like, all right, cool. We'll break the rule. That one is okay to go with. Um, I mentioned this before. I, I think the way to do this is to not just say, hey, do the greatest of all time without giving you real analysis. So what yeah. we'll do here is go through quarterbacks in the Super Bowl era specifically. Because okay. if we said all quarterbacks, and we're going to try our best to do decades like the generational aspect of the game has changed there's been an evolution in yes. fact we've done numerous podcasts about the evolution of specific aspects of the game if you've missed any of those episodes highly encourage you mm -hmm. to go back but i do think about football as as a team sport and then to win and yet you threw out eli manning as as an example of a guy mm -hmm. that made his legacy in that game do we put too much on a championship when evaluating the greatest of all time? I mean, again, Yams, uh, you, you're talking to a, a former role player. I played quarterback, at, at, you know, at times in my life. Uh, when in the National Football League, I was a role player, special teamer, fullback, backup tailback at times, backup receiver, all of those things. So 
Absolutely. Getting Super Bowls means everything, right? Because if you win that Super Bowl, everybody makes more money. Everybody becomes more valuable. Every, you know, everybody, even the front office guys, uh, everything changes. So, yeah, I, I'm not going to say we put too much weight on it. No, we don't. I think we put the right amount of rate weight on it because at the end of the day, that's why we play this game. We play this game to win championships, not just to get the GOAT yeah. label. It's tough because I think it applies across the board in every sport. There's enough players that played, and you and I are yeah. roughly the same age, you know, in the 90s in the NBA. It, there was Jordan. And you know what? Jordan kind of messed it up for a lot of players. Because yeah. how many times do we go through a list of guys and go, hey, you don't have a chip? You know what? And it's like, dude, that guy was amazing. And yet... You didn't win the ultimate yeah. goal. I yeah. mean, to me, that has to be considered. And when you're going up against the real GOAT, who's MJ, like that's <laughs> yeah. going to be a little bit of a problem here. All right. I want to give some historical context on some of the numbers. And once again, Super Bowl era. So right around 1970 is where we're going to mark this sucker here. What we're going to do here is look at an average number of passing yards per game by quarterback since 1970 in five-year increments. So from 1970 to 2020, the number of yards per game has increased by 84 which does speak to the evolution of quarterback of play, yep. wide receivers, the whole thing. We did those specific episodes once again here. Uh, real briefly, 1970, 161.4 passing yards. That's 75, a notch up to 162.8. 1980, a big spike, 196, then 204. Eventually, you get to the point in 2020 where you're talking about 245 passing yards per game. So some rough numbers to analyze there. We saw that number hit over 200, by the way, in the early 80s, and then boosted by a quarterback who put up no numbers that really no one has ever seen. In fact, when I was a kid, he was my favorite quarterback, and I wasn't even a Dolphins fan. I was just a fan of Dan Marino. 1984, uh -huh. the dude threw for 5,000 yards. A number no one would reach. This is when you know you're legit until Drew Brees did it 24 years <laughs> later. Like to me, that's it's not a record that happened two years later. It got broken. No, no, no. Took 24 years, almost three decades for that number to be hit. Now, Marino even threw 48 touchdowns, and that was a number no one hit until Peyton Manning, who something tells me you might point to a little bit mm -hmm. later in this podcast, had 49 <clears throat> in 2004. We could also say that he played in an era where defensive backs got a, away with a little bit Absolutely. more, right? I mean, not to make this a basketball podcast, but I do think about basketball mm -hmm. in the 90s. Like, yo, that was that was tough, man. They what were they fighting. Did, they're out there, legit. <laughs> now you like, you breathe too hard on a guy and it's I about. saw a guy get a tech for saying the wrong thing. He said some words <laughs> that just weren't right. It's just yeah, can't do words. It. <laughs> uh, when he retired, by the way, Marino, he led the league in passing yards, completions, and passing touchdowns. He also led the AFC and passing touchdowns from 1983 to 1988. That's so crazy, how do you view a guy like Dan Marino? So first of all, people got to understand, if you haven't met this dude, he's huge, okay? He is a big dude. He was at the um, at the Buffalo game when I was up there, when I was in my cold leather jacket yeah. and all that stuff with Colleen and Steve Smith and MJD. Uh, he was there, and he's huge. So he's a big dude, and he ain't running nowhere. And to, to, to understand what Dan Marino meant to the quarterback position, I think he was the first guy to show coaches, to show everybody in the football world, you can will a team up and down the field with, and win games consistently yeah. with just your arm. Just your arm. You don't necessarily need to – because you got to think, the, you know, the 60s and 70s were dominated by the running back position. They ran the football. The fullbacks even ran the football uh, in the early years of the game. And then you get this gunslinger and Dan Marino coming out of Pittsburgh uh, who, you know, had a little bit of a, a weird delivery. But at the end of the day, he can hit any point on the field, any point on the field. Um, and to me, that's his, his significance to the position, the fact that he was a guy. That, and again, I always talk about this on our Total Access show. There's not a lot of human beings who can will their team up and down the field with just the abilities of their arm. Dan Marino, in my opinion, was the first, at least the first big time guy where the numbers proved it and everything uh, on the scene at the quarterback position. All right. A little bit of a tangent here, because I had asked you about the Super Bowl being that one moment that kind of makes a career. And as I'm thinking about mm -hmm. what your response was, I almost now feel bad, and maybe I shouldn't feel bad, but like, <laughs> think about that though. You got to have so many right circumstances to go into place here. And it's not just about what you do individually on the field, it's about schematically, 
your coaches, the play calling, your defense, which we'll yep. talk about a little bit later in this podcast. Like, can you imagine, like, if, and we'll talk about Joe Montana in a second here. If I said Dan Marino's playing with the Niners, like, do we have a very different conversation about Dan Marino and a very different one about Joe Montana? Oh, absolutely. I mean, and again, I know we're going to get to Joe Montana, but you talk about Joe Montana. Yes, uh, won four Super Bowls, all of those things he wanted every time he got there, but he had Bill Walsh. Yeah. And I'm one of those guys where, to me, you cannot discount the fact that Bill Walsh, who is one of the architects of offense in our game, almost every single offense on any level of anything of football has some type of Bill Walsh principle associated with it. That's how influential that guy was. And so that's who Joe Montana had. And so I kind of, you know, I give some of that success to Bill Walsh as well. Yeah, I had asked you on a previous podcast when we talked about running backs. I said Emmitt Smith, right? And he's like, dude, he was good. But I think about those big boys up front, up those front, offensive lines. Hey, Newton, Larry Allen, those guys. And I played with Larry Allen, Hall of Fame guy. We, talk, we talked about, um, you know, the pass rushes and Lawrence Taylor. And again, I think Lawrence Taylor is one of the best ever to do it, sure. right? But. He was in that buddy line defense who was kind of new to the to to the to the National Football League and it had some advantageous situations for him. Yeah. Let's just say that. I say I respond to everything that M Rob said with this. By the time we get to the end of the podcast, <laughs> who you think is the GOAT or who you thought was your selection, it might be different. Cause as I was going through those notes, I had a guy in my head, and after I finished digesting everything, I said, I, Started I don't, changing, right? I don't <laughs> know if it's my guy. So I'm just throwing that out there. It, it could be very different if you just stick with us here. Joe Montana, I will bring him up now. Mm-hmm. Obviously different than Marino. You mentioned that offense with Walsh, a West Coast offense that relied heavily on a little bit more efficiency, less on the dare I say that, Brett Favre, sort of gunslinger mentality. Mm-hmm, we'll mm-hmm. talk about Favre coming up here. Uh, his numbers, over 40,000 passing yards, 273 passing touchdowns. Those numbers might seem big, but for context, they're not even in the top 18 all time. Here's the difference, though. He won two MVPs, and he delivered when it mattered the most. A 127.8 passer rating in four Super Bowls, by the way, all championships, also had 11 touchdowns, zero interceptions in those games, and it also helps if you have a guy named Jerry Rice. Jerry the Rice, the GOAT, the greatest wide receiver that, we, that we've ever seen. But, I mean, to hear those numbers from Joe Montana, and, again, I don't want our listeners to say, oh, Mike Rob talking about Bill Walsh to take something away from Joe no, Montana. No. no, that 128 passer rate, I mean, those are real numbers. 11 touchdowns, zero interceptions. He did it. He played. He did that. Yeah. He played those games. He had to make the real in-game decisions. He had to be cool as a cucumber. I remember they were talking about, I forget that Super Bowl, where he had to make that big, long drive, and he's in the huddle talking about John Candy up in the stands. I mean, that's that was his superpower, being calm and collected in those crazy situations. But again, I, when you have a guy like a Bill Walsh, who, again, through necessity because his offensive line wasn't that good at some of the lower levels, had to develop a new style of offense that the, that the league hadn't seen. I, again, Ernie Zampezi did the same thing. Sure. Uh, Mike Martz at, at the time. You remember uh, Mike Martz when he had um, our Kurt Warner. Kurt Warner, I mean, set all types of records, right? Yeah. But when he left Mike Martz and that offense wasn't coached the same, he went to the Giants, Kurt looked a little bit different. To me, that had a lot to do, again, with the play caller. And it flips the other way. Yep. I, you know, I, it, we talked about this on another episode about Tua. Um, oh, man. You know, look at how different his season was with Mike McDaniel there. And it's mm-hmm. not enough. It's just sometimes gra- guys gravitate towards a specific seam, mm-hmm. scheme, a, a, just a better fit talk to differently from a coach's perspective i you know how you show up to work like those and your mindset heading into that day changes depending on on leadership and it's not a positive or a negative thing you know not to knock anyone it's just kind of the reality Mm -hmm. of some of those situations i mentioned Favre. i think he's important to get to it's a guy who's won three consecutive mvps 95 through 97 he's still fourth all time in yards touchdown only behind couple guys who could be on the Mount Rushmore of quarterbacks and Brady Breeze and Manning. 18 seasons of 3,000 plus passing yards, second only to yeah, TB12, and his 11 Pro Bowls were the most by a quarterback when he retired. There's a lot of good that comes with Brett Favre. There's also some stuff that happens when, <laughs> when you play a whole lot as well. Also, the record holder in most career interceptions thrown and fumbles, 336 INTs, 166 fumbles. 
A total of 502 career turnovers. That doesn't even sound right, you saying that. Right. Yams. And 500 they, and win? <laughs> and two, and he has a winning record? <laughs> wow. I mean, that's that's Hall of wow. Fame worthy just in itself, right? Being able to overcome the turnovers that you created. Yeah. <laughs> Green Bay fans, by the way, they'll love this because Aaron Rodgers is coming up later in this episode. <laughs> Think about... He's kind of the antithesis when it comes to touchdown to interception ratio. And yet Favre, you know, look, mm -hmm. context here, every one in every 30 throws that Favre threw that's crazy. was was an INT. <laughs> like that's crazy to me. But there's also something to be said for playing and being mm -hmm. available. Most consecutive starts by a quarterback, 299. That to me is as impressive as any of the passing records that he holds. It is very impressive. I mean, quarterbacks sometimes, yams, you, you mean, we see it all the time. I mean, hell, our referees can't get roughing the passer yeah. right, right? It, because sometimes they're in such compromising um, positions and situations when they're trying to throw the football and just kind of operate their offense. And so the fact that Brett Favre threw deaths in his family, through everything that's gone on, through stuff going on in his personal life that we all knew that was a very public thing, he still went out there and played football. So to me, yeah, that, that, there has to be something said about that, but there also has to be something said about that. And again, I, I, I almost think I'm saying something wrong because it's Brett Favre. He only got one Super Bowl, right? Yeah. One. Yeah. I'll, like I talk about Aaron Rodgers. How many Super Bowls he got? He got one. one. He got the same amount as me. And yeah. I have none. I had none of the talent those guys um, had. And if they were that great, shouldn't we get more out of them? Shouldn't it? Shouldn't we get more championships? Yeah, I'm just I, saying. You can throw that out there. But <laughs> once again, by the end of this podcast, you might say there's a reason for That's it. True. And some guys that have more of those championships might have just had. I don't know, a top five defense might have had a guy like Jerry Rice that was out there. Those circumstances dictate a lot of this conversation. I mentioned both the good and the bad for Favre, and we've done that for a lot of these players. Does Is he in this conversation? I mean, clearly he is because we're talking about him, but should he be discussed this way with some of those turnovers that you made reference to? I think so. When I think about the greatest of all time, I think about you have to when you think about the position. You can't think about the position without thinking about the player. Yeah. And when I think about the quarterback position, and yeah, we can say what we want to say about Brett Favre and his personal life and misuse funds, whatever the word you want to say about it, interceptions, all that. At the end of the day, when you think about the quarterback position in the National Football League, Brett Favre does come across your brain. Uh, you've ever heard of the, the word uh, entrapment? Yep. Okay. <laughs> I'm actually glad. I wasn't even doing this on purpose, but I just realized that if you not if you didn't give the answer that you just gave, I was going to follow up on a conversation you and I had off air today about Josh Allen because uh -huh. we were talking about some of the the, the turnovers uh -huh. and you know he's leading the NFL in takeaways at this point uh, of this record, and you still stand by your guy because of that mentality. It's the mentality, yeah. and again, uh, I, I, in my notes, I talked about Brett Favre being authentic. His personality was authentic, and it showed up in his play right Brett Favre was gonna try you he was gonna talk trash to Warren Sapp he was gonna get in his face there yeah he was gonna see a tight he didn't see a window small enough that he didn't think he could get a football through yeah. so I can live with that and to a back to our conversation with Josh Allen I can live with that he fights defensive tackles at practice and in the game I seen it with my own two yeah. eyes jams so yeah I can live with a couple of interceptions yeah no so once again <laughs> so for anyone who's who's thinking that M Rob talks out of both sides of his mouth no he is very consistent in the line of thinking Yes. Uh, as far as quarterbacks go, Drew Brees, and I think about the numbers, I think about his winning mentality, I think about some of the production here and just how prolific he he was when he was playing. Here's some numbers for you. Over 80,000 passing yards, 571 passing touchdowns. Both of those numbers behind Tom Brady. The guy owns five of the 14 5,000-yard <laughs> passing seasons of all time. Next player, by the way, is Tom Brady. Here's the other number for me that is really meaningful. The three highest single season completion percentages in NFL history, those are Drew, Drew Brees's. Mm. 2017, 72%. 2018, 74.4%. And 2019, 74.3%. I mean, you were pointing at me when I was Bro, saying it. It's crazy. I just want our listeners and viewers to think about that. For three years straight, Drew Brees, three out of every four passes was complete. It's wild. That is ridiculously crazy. And guys, the defense, defensive backs, everybody, they get paid a lot of money to not allow the wide receivers to catch the football. I mean, 
That stat is crazy, Yams. It's crazy. What was it about Drew Brees that had him being that successful statistically? Um, I would say accuracy. I mean, th- that, 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 <laughs> and p- where you put the football. Because, see, Drew Brees, I wouldn't sit here, and I don't, I don't think anybody would say Drew Brees had the strongest arm, right? But his ability to fit the ball in the tight windows, right, with anticipation and timing, and it's a catchable ball. Like, so you, everybody knows I'm Bill's Mafia, right? And I, I love Josh Allen. And even when I talk to Josh, like, the conversations I've had with him, I'm like, Josh, sometimes, bro, when you throw that thing, man, especially as a running back, when I do my punch and pivot and I turn around over the football, you throwing smokers, man. That, that nose of that football is down. And to complete a reception, yes, there's the throw part to it, but the other part is me being yeah. able to catch it. And the nose is always down with a guy like Josh, with Josh Allen. Patrick Mahomes, oftentimes the nose is a little bit down because they're driving the football, right? Drew Brees, the nose stayed up. Right. It, it's almost like it, it, and it allows the ball, it allows the receiver to snatch it out of the air. Right. And be able to do kind of what he wants to do with it. To me, I'm not so sure there's been another quarterback better at ball placement and accuracy. And if you can put the ball where you need to put it um, where the receiver can go, that means you're processing information at a very high level. That's to me, that was Drew Brees' superpower, his accuracy, his ball placement and his ability to process things. I mean, there's oftentimes on Drew Brees' second step. So for all my quarterbacks out there, the first step is your power step to get away from your under center. Your second step is another power step to kind of continue to drive away. By the second step, Drew Brees oftentimes knew where he was going with the football and the 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 defense hadn't always set itself by that time, but Drew Brees knew what they were doing before oftentimes they knew what they were doing. Um, again, I don't know if there's been another quarterback on that, le- you know, to his level of doing it, throwing the ball, ball placement, and obviously processing data. Okay. I'm, I, I, how many Super Bowls though? One. Yeah. That's why I, that's, that, that's the, that's the thing for me. But you just said something, and we highlighted the accuracy for for Drew Brees. Mm-hmm. I would imagine you felt like when you were playing quarterback, you could hit any mark anywhere. I would imagine every other quarterback in the NFL, when they hear accuracy, they're like, are you kidding me? I could hit like a quarter. You want to throw a quarter down the football field? I'll hit that damn spot. Let me stop you right there. I agree with that. I believe every single quarterback or everybody who's played quarterback says that publicly. Yes. I'm Do they real. feel it? I'm real Mike Robb, though. <laughs> okay? And when I got to the National Football League, I remember calling my brother, who was one of my biggest fans, and one of my, my dude, one of my best friends. And I remember saying, bro, I don't know if I could have played quarterback in this league. Wow. The accuracy and ball placement is 100% on point. And I used to always remember, I used to always have to think about where that ball was going to go. And it wasn't until, you know, later on in my, you know, uh, my last year playing and I was really feeling good about it, where the ball was just coming out, just throw it. I wasn't aiming. I wasn't aiming. And the great quarterbacks just do that naturally. It's just, it's just, what, it, it's just yeah. what it was. But I, to your point, yeah, every quarterback will say that out loud. But, yeah, what are they saying to themselves? And I believe, yeah, quarterbacks will say they can hit every part on the football field. But do they really know if they can? No, I don't think they do. Okay, that's good. Uh, I just I kind of wanted to hear that because I heard we gave the numbers for for Drew Brees, and yet I'm going through a short list of the greatest quarterbacks that have played in this game, and I think it's important to highlight those numbers in particular because I think all these guys can say because how many I hate those you know I shouldn't say hate those. <laughs> um, it's frustrating at times when we get closer to the NFL draft and you hear the same phrases like pinpoint accuracy or you know a guy can make every throw on the football field. And in my mind, I'm like, all right, I bet that guy believes it, but how come they're not all doing it? Well, a lot of those buzzwords come up because not everybody watches tape. No doubt. And so what happens is you see one guy say it and stuff. people start, start falling back to that yeah. stuff. That's why I always tell, even, uh, to our producers here, I can't talk about a guy unless I've seen him yeah. in, on tape. Yeah. It's that simple. No, it, and I... <sighs> I remember when Justin Herbert was coming out yeah, and people were talking about a lack of accuracy for him because the numbers were raw. And if you, I just happened to know this because, you know, I was obviously covering him when he was in college. He had like one season, I, the team had tracked it. I think mm-hmm. it was like 45 drops. I mean, it was something unbelievable. Wow. And how many times I watched a game to your point, yep. watching the film going, 
yo, that that throw couldn't have been better. And that's the guy a catchable just drew, ball. Exactly. So <laughs> sometimes those numbers are a little skewed. But the point is, all these guys are super talented. But the next guy on our list is, I think, a real contender for the GOAT spot. That's Peyton Manning. Mm. Different facet of the game here across the board. What he, I could see it, man. How about you just take this? Hey, bro, Peyton about, Manning was a bad man. All right, all oh, of, <laughs> he was. All right, here, here are the numbers here. Five NFL MVP awards, most all time. Three second place finishes. Seven time first team all pro. That ties the most by any quarterback. Otto Graham, the other guy. Two Super Bowl wins and a Super Bowl MVP. Those, some of the statistics and some of the numbers there, quantify it for me. Bro. So, <clears throat> yeah, yeah, I wasn't alive when every single quarterback that's played in the National Football League has went through. I used to, my favorite quarterback of all time before I experienced Peyton Manning was um, uh, Joe Namath, right? And no, I wasn't alive when Joe Namath was, was on the sidelines doing his thing. But when I watched the tape and I watched film of him, he was calling his own plays. And then he would put on a fur coat on the sideline man you know i just thought that was so cool and i'm like damn man how can that dude just be wearing a fur coat go out partying the night before call his own place understand the game that much where he can do that so that's why i roll with uh joe namath and then i encounter Peyton manning okay so yams he's the greatest quarterback of all time in my opinion okay he's the greatest quarterback of all time in my opinion okay first of all immediately when he got in the national football league he didn't look overwhelmed. Yes, he had a, the interceptions were there, but he looked like he could operate in the National Football League. That's what every football player wants to know, man. I, like I used to tell you on a previous episode, I would call home. Man, how did I look, man? Forget my numbers. Did I look like did I look like a kid out there or did I look like a grown man I was supposed to be out there? He looked the part. That's number one. Um, and he basically developed an <laughs> offense, dude. Like, for real. Yeah. And I say that because I was in college when he, um, you know, was kind of early in his career in 2002, 2003, 2004. And I remember our coaching staff, because um, Coach Caldwell used to be at Penn State, and our co uh, coaching staff, we would go to Indy to see the passing principles and things that they were doing. And and what he did was he married some some real cool passing principles to the outside zone stretch play and all those things. He was able to kind of operate everything at the line of scrimmage. He really yeah. didn't necessarily need the guy calling plays from the sideline. He needed the information and the input from the guys and stuff from the booth. But he was the maestro. He was handling it all at the line of scrimmage. I think the Denver Broncos thought that's what they were getting with Russell Wilson, a guy who was going to bring them a playbook. See, I knew Adam Gates. Adam Gates was my guy yeah. in San Francisco. Adam Gates used to be the uh, office coordinator for Peyton Manning when he was in Denver. And Adam told me, Mike, when Peyton got there, when he was choosing a team, he sat me down and taught me his offense and what we were going to run. Wow. Think about what I'm saying. Yeah. Your offensive coordinator is paid to be the, <laughs> the top brain on the offense, and he said, no, nah, bro, I'm, you know, I'm going on my team search. I'm going around to see what teams I want to go to. I want to make sure the front office is straight. Don't worry about the offense. I'll teach the offense. I'll teach the, co I'll teach the coordinator the offense. That was his thing, and I want to make sure my defense is straight. So he went to Denver, and he sat down and taught a whole playbook to them. Okay, think about that. To me, that is amazing. That's on that Joe Namath thing where I can go out the night before and then come out and call plays. <laughs> That's why you, yeah. you see my train of thought. You see my thinking. Okay, he did it with multiple teams. He did it with Indy, right? Broke a bunch of records, did all that. And then he did it with the Denver Broncos. In I mean, 2013 was the best offensive season that our game has ever seen. And, of course, it ended in defeat to my Seattle Seahawks. When I was in San Francisco Yams, we played the Indianapolis Colts. I was a returner. I got tripped up. I almost scored a touchdown that game. Anyway, we were down by two. Maybe three. That's, that's inconsequential. He got the ball on his own, like, seven or eight-yard line. Eight minutes left in the game, Yams. We on the sideline saying, bruh, we finna win this thing. We're going to get the ball back. He's going to punt it to his Nez. I'm telling our Nez, Nez, man, we're going to take this thing back, bro. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. Alex Smith going to throw me a rail route down the We're going to win this game. <laughs> Yams, that excitement turned into me taking a knee mad as Peyton Manning is taking a knee on our four-yard line. Game over. He held the ball for eight and a half minutes, and we didn't touch the ball again. We were, we were moving the ball in their defense, yeah. but he had the wherewithal to say, you know what? <clears throat> Y'all ain't going to touch the field no more. 
He made sure he hiked the ball with one second on the clock every single time, and he managed the entire damn thing. I remember watching our coaches on the sideline like, there's nothing we can do. There is nothing we can do. Oh, and then one last thing. I'm sorry. Peyton Manning is the best quarterback of all time, in my opinion. After we beat the hell out of him in the Super Bowl, okay, this dude, I sat there and watched him. He waited for every single one of us to finish our um, press conferences. All of us. You know, I wasn't a quarterback, so I'm a fullback. I got a little table. You know what I'm saying? He waited for (laughs) all of us to finish. Shook every last one of our hands. Every last one. I'm talking about all 53 guys that were, could be available for the game. He made sure he made a connection with every single one of them. And then the man took a picture with my mama. Okay? Wow. Why he's in the middle of being defeated. Okay? I ain't never seen nothing like it. So, Yams, the only thing that stopped uh, to me that stopped Peyton Manning from getting even more Super Bowls um, was the fact that he physically couldn't do it anymore toward, at the end. If he was as healthy as the Tom Brady was, I think he would get off. He had a coach, a defensive guy like uh, Bill Belichick. I think he would have more. But at the end of the day, he took two teams. He'd been in a Pro Bowl with two different teams. He was an All-Pro with two different He took multiple guys. He elevated multiple guys, and he had his own offense. For that, I give him the best quarterback of all time. All right, just for clarification purposes, I just want to be clear. I said here. a lot. No, no, no. What you <laughs> said about teaching his offense, like Landon in Denver – Sounds amazing. I just want to be clear here. The other guys that we've been talking about so far and the guys that we will be talking about on this podcast, you, A, don't do that, can't do that. I'm not saying they can't. Okay. Right? They just didn't do it. They haven't done it. Okay. And all I'm saying is, yeah, are there some nuances about the Mike McCarthy offense that are strictly tailored to Aaron Rodgers? Absolutely. Are there some nuances of offense that are strictly tailored to the Mahomes of the world and the Absolutely. But um, when Tom Brady was looking for, when he was a free agent and he was looking for a team to go to, when I heard the Tampa, uh, 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 Tampa Bay Buccaneers general manager, when he talked about him, he was like, it was almost like Tom was trying to get us to pick him. Right. Like it was almost like, wow, I didn't mm-hmm. know that I would get that type of Tom was looking for an offense that fit him. And yes, he had some passing principles that he would add to it but he won't bring an offense he won't say oh no it don't matter i'm gonna sit down and teach you about what i did up in here and this is what we're gonna do no byron leftwich and him and uh and uh bruce arians had to come together Together. okay and have that play okay i'm glad you bring that up last point here before we get to tom brady who's coming up next year (laughs) uh we mentioned drew Brees, indoor versus outdoor i played most of his career indoor i just want to throw this out there the numbers generally speaking are skewed better production indoor for Drew Brees. I say that for Peyton Manning as a comparison, the numbers generally equal indoor versus outdoor, which I think is, it it speaks to your point. It doesn't matter the venue. I know people talk about Peyton playing in the cold. Oh yeah. And then on top of that, he played in the AFC. Who did he have to go through? (laughs) He had to go through the Toms and the Bill Belichick's and he had to go through that gauntlet every single year. All right. So, Once again, the leader in the clubhouse on all this stuff, like when I saw we were going to do this episode, I'm like, oh, all right, this is going to be like the Tom Brady pay homage (laughs) to to the GOAT episode. This section is, okay? Uh, Brady and the number, like, are you serious? Some of this stuff is just, it's it's crazy here. Um, I'll just go through some of these wins. Entering the playoffs, Brady, 35 wins, uh, three more wins which he may or may not get next season, depending on what he decides. More playoff wins than any NFL franchise. <laughs> I, just crazy, crazy, except for the Patriots, uh, who has the most with 37. Here are some of the individual numbers. 89,000 passing yards, a little over that. 649 passing touchdowns. Seven Super Bowl wins. Ten Super Bowl appearances. All of those numbers, by the way, most all time. Three NFL MVP awards tied for the third best with Peyton Manning, Aaron Rodgers, still to come, by the way, only five times Super Bowl MVP in NFL history. When I say that there is a long friggin' list in front of me, it's a long list. I will stop there and let you explain what the most special thing about Brady is. Maybe the answer is longevity, but 
there's a reason why you called him the greatest winner, and I think it speaks to the Super Bowls that I made reference to, but you hedge on calling him the greatest quarterback of all time. Yeah, um, he is the greatest winner our game has ever seen. He is the greatest force multiplier at the quarterback position um, that this game has ever seen. I mean, and, and I can make arguments that those first two or three Super Bowls um, were kind of one off the defensive prowess, running game prowess or whatever, before Brady kind of figured out this greatness about him, uh, uh, you know, figured out what made him himself, right? Um, the numbers that you just talked about, to me, that uh, not only is it um, a testament to, um, you know, the teams that he's played to get played on and, and his ability, his football ability, but, yeah, it's the longevity, man. What, 22, 23 seasons? Yeah. Nobody does that. That wasn't even a thing. He's playing alongside guys that weren't even born. Yeah. When he first started playing um, in, the, in the National Football League, not started playing football, but in the NFL, when he first started playing, they, they weren't even born. Um, and again, being the greatest winner isn't a bad thing. And I don't want this to seem like I'm knocking Tom Brady or anything like that. I just think that when I compare him, I'm talking about the quarterback position and the demands and things that are associated with the quarterback position. I just put him a little bit of a notch or two behind Peyton Manning. The 10 Super Bowl appearances, by the way, twice as many as any other quarterback in NFL history. <laughs> the Super Bowl completions, 277. That's a season. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> he's got more completions in the Super Bowl than any other player has attempts. Bruh. Peyton Manning, by the way, 155 attempts. It's crazy, man. And again, like I don't know if we're going to see another quarterback play this long. Yeah. I mean, just simply because I do think that um, – you know, when these quarterbacks, because they make so much money, when you look in your bank account, you got $150 million. It's yeah. hard to get up and go to work. You know what I mean? Go yeah. get hit up on, hit and beat up on every day. But I don't know if we'll see a guy play this long again. My guess is probably no. You can make the argument yes because mm -hmm. of nutrition and, and training and all that stuff. But I think about some of the younger guys and what this position is. Like, think about Brady's not running around here. We nope. talked about the evolution of some of these offenses. These dudes are expected to take off. These younger quarterbacks – I think to me that screams what we've witnessed, even if it's not done, and hopefully he keeps on playing, and I don't know if it's going to be with Tampa Bay or not. Hopefully I, hopefully he does because I like watching him out there, but I don't think we'll ever see this in our no, lifetimes. Well, I might get in trouble for saying this, but I think Brady is the, the, the last of a dying breed of, stat, of the statue quarterback. Yeah. Um, and again, I'm not saying that you have to have a runaround guy, but he has to be dynamic. He has to be able to be Joe Burrow-esque, right? Avoid a little sure. bit of a pressure. Kind of scramble for five or ten yards to get the first down. You have to be able to challenge the defense that way. I got two more names do for you. And then we can, although you already said it's Peyton Manning, so I'll get my pick <laughs> a little bit later here. Brett Favre talked about the numbers, and I said we would talk about Aaron Rodgers. Hard not to. Four NFL MVP awards, second behind your guy and Peyton Manning. Uh, 59,000 passing yards. Mm. That's in the top 10. 475 passing touchdowns. That's fifth all time. Yes, he's got the Super Bowl and a Super Bowl ring. To me, what I think is really cool, fewest interceptions yep. of any player with at least 350 passing touchdowns. The next closest, Matty Ice, Matt Ryan. I don't, you know, I think if you ask a Green Bay fan, maybe they'll say Aaron Rodgers is the greatest of all time. Mm -hmm. There's some <laughs> things when I watch him play that, just this even mentality, that Tom Brady kind of effect. I always think that's really impressive. I don't know if there's ever been a quarterback, and maybe you just disagree with me because I know it's Peyton Manning, but when I watch them play, it always looks so freaking easy. It, the game looks easier to me, to Aaron Rodgers, than any quarterback I've ever seen play. Yeah, uh, uh, he may have he may have one of the top arm talents. Sure. And guys, I want to when I say arm talent, I mean being able to throw from different arm angles, having the big arm to be able to push it downfield. We've seen all the hail marys uh, from an Aaron Rodgers, the accuracy, ball placement, all of those. That's what I'm talking about when I say arm talent. Um, and, and Aaron Rodgers, there isn't an arm angle, there isn't a pass, there isn't a, 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 a defender who can get his, their arms in the way to stop Aaron Rodgers from completing the pass if he's trying to, if he's trying to do that. I mean, I, there's a lot to say about Aaron Rodgers. I think, I think sometimes he doesn't get put into the, 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 the greatest of all time conversation just based off of kind of some of his recent things with the media sure, and, you sure. know, retiring, not retiring, all those types of things. But uh, to only have 105 interceptions through as many years as he's played and as many times as they've thrown the football, as many times as they've lived in Green Bay of moving the offense 
just through his arm. Um, that's pretty impressive. And yeah, you can't have the GOAT conversation without talking about Aaron Rodgers as well. I will say this though, Yams. I believe when I uh, modern, and I mean like this this generation, the Patrick Mahomes, the Josh Allen's, the those guys. I do believe this this generation is heavily influenced by yeah. I mean by uh, Aaron Rodgers. I, you can see his game in all of them. Uh, you mentioned Patrick Mahomes. He's the guy that we're going to talk about here. He's 27 years old. He's not in the GOAT conversation right now, like, quite honestly, just because of his age. He hasn't done there, but he's on his way. He's already got an MVP award. He's got a Super Bowl win. He's been a Super Bowl MVP. I'm not even going to get into the numbers because they're not necessarily going to compare no. because he hasn't played long enough here. But we talk about the magic of Mahomes. He's one of the special players that this league has of this generation here, right? Like we've heard Brady and Rodgers say, hey, that next group is pretty damn good. And Mahomes is there. If I said to you in 10 years, you and I are still working together, mm -hmm. knock on, yeah. right, that's glass, but oh, knock on wood, come on. we're still working together, we're doing this podcast, we do another one of these versions, is is Patrick Mahomes going to be the GOAT? Mm. If Andy Reid stays around <laughs> for that long too, yeah, I, I think, I don't think it'll be a question. I mean, the rate at which he's putting up these numbers, um, the the growth in his yeah. game i've seen him gone from you know not being able to just check the ball down to now you know they're functioning right they're being very efficient as an offense and he's hitting the right receiver almost every single time right but i will say this it, it's 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 tough to it's tough to anticipate the huge numbers again if he doesn't have Andy Reid and I can't wait to see him in the playoffs without Tyreek Hill. Yeah. I want to see that because Tyreek Hill is one of those special players as well. Okay. You are um you bring the players perspective, mm -hmm. like the guy who actually did it on the field. I just bring the talking deal <laughs> and the numbers. It's all good, uh from a math perspective, I didn't even crunch these numbers. I love how I'm taking credit for crunching projection numbers. Hey man. Whatever. Hey, the listeners uh, hear you. No, no, no. It's uh, but how about this? Our our crew who's amazing, they actually did some of the numbers for us based on projections five years as a starting quarterback thus far and what we could see. So if Mahomes plays thirteen more seasons, which okay. would put him at forty, by the way, <laughs> the numbers project out to eighty six thousand five hundred passing yards and six hundred eighty six passing touchdowns. It's fewer passing yards than Brady, but more touchdowns. If Mahomes plays 15 more seasons, that puts him at 42. Come on now. This is just crazy town. The numbers, 96,000 passing yards, 762 passing touchdowns. That would be almost 7,000 more yards than Brady and 113 more touchdowns. So it does give you some context on the trajectory of his career. Um, did they crunch his bank account too? How much would See, he have half made? Billion. Did he make three billion through yeah. fifteen years after all of that too? I mean, jeez. But yeah. Um, again, if Andy Reid, Eric B. Enemy, those play callers are there, man. Uh, yeah, this, this run can go for a long time. Yeah. All right. One more thing. Actually, okay. two more things for context here that I want to position for people listening to this podcast. We always do. It's talk radio. I spent a long time in my career doing talk radio. Like I get it. Like <laughs> summertime comes around, you need some topics. Oh, greatest of all time. You have all these debates here. The generational thing is it's hard to compare across generations. Mm -hmm. Our team tried to do that here. So we'll, we're going to give you some stats here, comparing players across generations, try to build out some stats that compare some of these guys within a generation to see how much better they were than their peers. So from 2017 to 2022, the average passing yards in a game was 230 and a half. Patrick Mahomes averaged 303 <laughs> yards a game over that span. So that's oh almost 73 goodness. yards over the average. Drew Brees, by the way, 57 yards over the average. Okay. Peyton Manning, 54 yards over the average. Dan Marino, Almost 50, 48.8. Brady, 44 over the average. Rodgers, 30 over the average. Favre, 29 over the average. And then Joe Montana, 10 over the average. And Rob, I got one more for you. Completion percentage over NFL average in their career. Joe Montana, when he was playing in his era, mm -hmm. the average NFL completion percentage was 56%. He was at 63. So his average percentage was plus 7.2. Breeze, he was plus 6.3, Manning a little over 5, Favre a little over 3, Rodgers was at 3, Marino at 2.8, Brady at 2.8, Emma Holmes at 2.2.
So you found something pretty interesting when you were going through those numbers. The average completion percentage has been going up over time. The QBs have been getting better. Yeah, the, the QB position has evolved. They've been getting better. Again, you look at that Joe Montana, the NFL average completion percentage was 56%, yeah. right? Like, like that's not – that wouldn't be good in today's football. You look at Patrick Mahomes, the NFL average is 64%, almost a 10% uh, jump. So it, it, just, again, just the, the quarterback position in the passing game in general General is getting better and they're getting coached better as well. All right. I threw this out there at the top of the show. I continue to mention it. And here's the time. This is the number that really matters the most when it comes to the GOAT. Touched on this a little bit before about Joe Montana, the team around him. That is important. Defense, baby. I'm talking about the defense. <laughs> we looked at how often each quarterback of the ones that we discussed had a top 10 defense, M Rob. Mm-hmm. Brady had top 10 defenses 17 times, seven more than Joe Montana. Drew Brees and Aaron Rodgers only had three, and Dan Marino four. So to me, while we can talk about you know the statistics when it comes to what these guys did individually, having a pretty damn good defense. That, to me, might be the complete differentiator for all this stuff. I think it is. Defense wins championships. That's an old axiom yeah. that, um, you know, that, that we always say. But I, I also think we have to kind of wrap our minds around this. Like, whenever you have, and again, some of these quarterbacks, like Tom Brady, when he was first drafted, nobody knew he was going to be yeah. w- what he was. But um, some of these high draft picks or guys that are with these high expectations, these big-time physical attributions – Oftentimes, the teams built around them aren't great because <laughs> for them to get a chance to get that person, they were the first pick in the draft sure. or whatever, and the team around them uh, wasn't so good. And so when you look at a guy like a Tom Brady, it, it makes sense. He was a six-round pick, so they actually had all the – they had to build a team around him because they didn't know he was going to be that good. But it's pretty – I didn't know Joe Montana had a top defense 10 times. I did not know that. Which, by the way, that 10 times, that's 77% of his seasons as a starter, he had a top 10 defense. Brady, by the way, 81% of his seasons, a top 10 defense. Uh. Mahomes, 60%. Favre, 42 <laughs> Manning, by the way, 41% of the time. Marino, oh God, I feel bad for Dan, 25%, Rodgers, 20 and then Drew Brees, the worst. Only 15.8% of his seasons as a starter, he had a top 10 defense. Well, but Drew Brees probably made more money than all these quarterbacks. Combined. Don't feel that bad for him. You know right. what I'm saying? So, right. again, you're pulling the money, putting it to the quarterback, can't build a team yeah. around you. That's kind of how those things work themselves out. Plus, he got that TV money, too, on the <laughs> back end. All of I'm it. trying to get some of that TV <laughs> money. You know what I'm saying? All right. Uh, we'd love to hear from you guys as well. I know we continue to ask for questions on a mailbag episode. I- I'd rather this. Uh, if you like this episode, share it on social media. I would love to see some of your guys' comments on who you think the GOAT is at that quarterback spot. Can't thank you guys enough for listening. And of course, we got some more episodes down the road of NFL Explained.